This morning, I have a role and you have a role. This morning, what I'm going to do is I'm going to preach the best I can. And this morning, what you're going to do, if you know Christ and believe in him, is you're going to rejoice. Your job is rejoicing this morning. Do you, can you do that? Can you join me in that? Okay, so you play an active role and I play an active role. Um, I don't want this to be passive. I'm going to preach something that every uh, Christian who's been a Christian for the wh- a while knows by heart. There's nothing new here. There's going to be no broad entertainment going on. I'm not going to dazzle you. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you once again what your soul really needs. And that's the best gospel presentation that I can find in the entire New Testament. And that's in Acts chapter two. I'm gonna give you what the nations need. I'm gonna give you what your grandkids need. I'm gonna give you what your kids need. I'm gonna give you what your neighbor needs. I'm gonna give you what your friends need. I'm gonna give you what, if you're a Christian, you know by heart and your job this morning is to simply rest and rejoice and celebrate and walk out of here strengthened by that same gospel and live as if you will actually live forever. To live as if Jesus actually did rise from the dead and this is not just something we do once a year, but this is a life that we live in Christ every single day. Can we do that together? All right. When I thought about the resurrection this week, I thought about the apostles. And the reason I thought about the apostles was what they went through for the sake of the name of Christ after he, after he died. Because if you think about the apostles before Jesus' death, they were sheepish, they were scared. I mean, even Peter, the most bold one of all, Peter and John, they kind of followed Jesus at a distance into the courtyard on Thursday night. But after he died, something happened that transformed them. It transformed them where they're, where they're willing to basically lay their, their neck on the line and, and go to death, go to a cross if they have to, be speared through or pierced through or persecuted or attacked. Something happened after the death of Jesus that totally rocked their world. And something happened after the death of Jesus that has totally rocked your world if you're a Christian. It's totally rocked my world. And that is that the Lord Jesus rose from the dead Sunday morning before the sun was barely starting to come up. And the Apostle Paul has an incredible story of testimony of conversion. In the book of Acts, you see Paul who's anti-Christ. He hates Christians. He hates everything Christian. And he's going to Damascus to take Christians captive and bring them back to Jerusalem and punish them. And then all of a sudden, Paul meets the one he's persecuting. He meets this exalted, glorious, wonderful, merciful Christ. And Christ speaks to Paul. And Christ knocks him over with his blazing glory. And Paul realizes he's persecuting the Christ and the people of Christ that actually really did rise. And his whole world is thrown upside down. And Paul is shipwrecked. He's stoned. He's beaten. he's, He's martyred under Nero's reign in the 60s AD because something happened to Paul. And what happened to Paul is he encountered not some mythological creature or some fake mythological story, he encountered a Jesus who actually lives. And that changed the rest of his life. Why is it that all the apostles, except maybe one, why is it all the apostles were willing to give their very lives? Because they had seen something that they couldn't be quiet about. They had seen something was undeniable. They had seen something that they couldn't reject. And it was more than words for them It was by sight. They saw the risen Christ. And so they knew in their heart of hearts that dying for Christ and preaching Christ was totally worth it because they knew that if Christ had died for them and Christ came back to life, they too would come back to life even if they lost their lives. This is the power of the resurrection that can flip our lives completely upside down where we actually live like we are immortal in Christ. We live like we're raised with Christ. We live like Jesus actually is Lord of the cosmos, that he's Lord of the nations. The forgiveness of sins is available to every single person, no matter how wicked, no matter how sinful, no matter how evil, no matter how much you hide your sin. Jesus Christ is the Savior and Lord of all peoples. So the message I'm preaching today will come as no surprise to you. The message I'm preaching today is not flashy. The message I'm preaching today that I want you to join me in exulting over is the message that we know is certain. Now, I'm not a big uh, sermon title person, but if I were to give this one a title, it would be this, what we know for certain. What we know for certain. Luke in chapter one of his gospel 
Right in the opening, he says, I'm writing these things, Theophilus, whoever he's writing to, Theophilus, that you may know with certainty the things you have been taught. And here's the thing about certainty, that if I live with certainty every single moment that Jesus is alive, Jesus is sovereign Lord, Jesus is merciful Savior, and Jesus is all sufficient for all peoples who trust him, then I will live an invincible existence. I will live an invincible life as a disciple. I will, my life will be flipped, turned upside down completely and utterly. And that's what I want us to walk away with. I don't want you to walk away with saying, oh, that was some new content. It was groovy. It was so nice stories, pastor. I don't want you to walk away with that. I want you to look straight past me. And I want you to look at the risen Jesus and be like, oh my gosh, he really is invincibly alive. He will never die again. That's what I want you to leave here rejoicing over. And that can be think of no better place in the whole scriptures of a gospel story that we're simply going to exult over together than Acts chapter 2. Go to Acts chapter 2, verse 22 through 39. This is Peter post-resurrection. And Peter went from a sheepish, sheepish coward to, to this roaring apostle. And, and Peter is like, guys, you want us to shut up about this gospel? Sorry, can't do that. Um, you, you can tell us whether we should listen to God rather than to man, or we should preach what we saw. We can't be quiet about what we saw. How could we be quiet when, when he is our salvation and he is our hope? And so the first thing we see, and we're going to take this sort of scene by scene in verse 22, is first we see what I call the man. We see the man, Jesus. He says, men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth. And you like that? A man. A man. And when we start out our gospel stories, what we usually do, and this is not wrong, but what we usually do is we say, God became man. We start with God and, and Peter is saying, yes, Jesus is God, but he's also Jesus of Nazareth, that he's the man. He's a man like you and like me. We tend to do one or the other. We tend to think that Jesus is more God than he is man, or we tend to think about Jesus as more man than he is God. And and throughout church history, that's where people go awry. They either lean too far here or too far there. But what Peter wants to make clear to us is that this Jesus of Nazareth, who is God, is also a man. And he must be truly God and truly man if you and I have any chance, if we have any hope, if we have any life, any resurrection. Jesus Christ must actually truly be completely man. Remember when Pilate was handing Jesus over, finally giving in to crucify Jesus. And he says, behold, what do you say? The man. Behold the man. The thing about Jesus is he cried, he nursed, he grew, he learned, he played, he worked, he slept, he got sick, he sweat, he hungered, he thirsted, he prayed, he laughed, he sang, he hugged, he got up early and saw the sun rise and he enjoyed sunsets over the water. He enjoyed the cool breeze on his face and all these wonderful things about being human just as you do and just as I do. And more than that, this same man kept the law of God given to man, the law that we could not keep. And this same man who was righteous man, came for sinful man and woman and children like you and me. And this righteous one was able to die as a righteous man for the unrighteous, for you and for me. If Jesus was not a man, there's no redemption. Because if you look around the room, if you look inside your own mind and heart, you're full of sin, I'm full of sin. We're full of all kinds of brokenness and sinfulness and weakness. There's no way that as a man or a woman or a child that you can please God. But thanks be to God, the man, Jesus Christ, pleased God for us. He kept the law of God for us, true God and true man. Amen. Gregory of Nazianzus, who was a church father early on, he said this. I think it's brilliant. He said, what is not assumed is not healed. If Christ did not assume our nature, he could not heal us of sin and death and corruption. I love Hebrews chapter two, verse 14. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things. Watch this powerful, remember, rejoice. This is your job, rejoice now. That through death, 
he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. So we see the man, Jesus. The second thing that Peter tells us in Acts 2 is the testimony. The testimony of God himself. The testimony of God the Father concerning God the Son. Look at it. Men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man, and here it is, attested to you by God. This is God's testimony about his Son. With mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through Jesus in your midst, as you yourselves know. One of the most important, maybe the most important witness to who Christ is and what he accomplished and what he came to do is God the Father himself. It says that God was in Christ reconciling the world and God was in Christ working signs and works and wonders. If you need to know who Jesus Christ is, You just need to look at the fact that he walked on water. Look at the fact that he stopped a storm. Look at the fact that he turned water to wine. Look at the fact that he raised a man from the dead after being dead four whole days. Lord, he stinketh, the Bible says in the KJV. Jesus raised the stinky man, all right? He raised the stinky man, Lazarus. All you have to do is look and see the power of God, the Father at work in God, the Son. People try to say, you know, Jesus never claimed to be God. And I'm like, rewind the tape. What'd you just say? Because Jesus said something more than I am God. He said, I am. Jesus took upon himself the personal name of God that God never shares with any other person or any other thing. He says, I'm Yahweh. He said more than I'm generally God. He said, I am Yahweh, Yahweh. And God testifies concerning his son, I love 1 John 5, verse 10. Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made God a liar because he has not believed the testimony that God has borne concerning his Son. And this is the testimony, that God gave us eternal life and this life is in his Son. In John 10, Jesus says it this way. If I'm not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, the works, even though you don't believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. We have the man. Jesus had to be man. We have the testimony of the Father working works and signs and wonders in Christ. And then in Peter's gospel that we're rejoicing over together, we have the crucifixion. Verse 23, this Jesus delivered up According to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. There's some powerful language here. That Jesus, according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, had to suffer. And he had to die. And he had to be crucified. Jesus didn't roll into Jerusalem on Holy Week like, man, I just really hope they accept me or else we're going to have to move to plan B. We're going to have to shift our plans. Jesus rolled in Jerusalem weeping because he knew the city would reject him. He knew he had to suffer. He knew he had to die. If you just read through the gospels, you see over and over, the son of man must be delivered up. He must suffer. He must die. He must rise again. He must, he must, he must. Jesus came with a great must. He must be killed. And crucified. Psalm 22 said the manner of death would be piercing through hands and feet. John 3, 14, Jesus says, as Moses lifted up the snake on the pole, so must the son of man be lifted up that whoever looks at him and believes in him may have life. Deuteronomy 21, 23 says, cursed is all who are hanged on a tree. Jesus went up on the tree and was cursed for you, for me. What I deserve, I know it within my bones and you know it within your bones. God doesn't even have to tell you through his word. He does, but he doesn't even have to tell you what we deserve is to be cursed and die for this, the rebellion against a holy, righteous, good God. But Jesus, the man, Jesus, the one with works and signs and miracles, Jesus, the man climbs up on the tree and is cursed in our place, cursed for our sin 
crucified. And just to think, what kind of God do we have that would plan such a gracious act? We have a God who is love, a God who is wisdom, a God who is righteousness, a God who is goodness, a God who is justice, a God who is perfect. For I delivered to you as of first importance, says Paul, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness by his wounds. You have been healed. So we have the man, we have God's testimony, we have the crucifixion, and now we find in Peter's gospel the resurrection. He says, God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. That's the most powerful sentence in this text right here. It was not possible for Jesus, the son of God, to be held captive by death. I want you to do something a little bit silly with me for just three seconds. I want you to take a deep breath in and hold it for three seconds. Ready? Go. In the first service, I said 10 seconds and I had to cut it real short. (laughs) It got a little awkward. Um, you could, not, you could not hold that breath in for very, for very long. You, you must let it out. And the grave took Christ in, and the grave could not hold Christ. It would be impossible for a grave to hold the prince of life. It would be impossible for the grave to hold the author of life, whom John calls in his letter, the eternal life. How could a temporary mortal grave hold the one who is life in and of himself? Not possible. That's why he burst out so easily, so effortlessly. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me for he's at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You've made known to me the paths of life. You'll make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, And knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and he spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we all are witnesses. And everyone who's a Christian is rejoicing right now saying amen. The father raises his son by the spirit It was not possible for the grave to hold the prince of life. Impossibility. He was not abandoned to Hades. His flesh was not corrupted. Jesus Christ, early Sunday morning, strolled out immortal, glorified, never to die again in perfect power and pure authority, just as he said he would. We move on now to the exaltation of Christ. Now, When you think about the gospel and when you preach the gospel or you share the gospel or you hear it sung, what often happens is you think about the incarnation, the life, the death, and the resurrection of Christ. And a lot of the time, people cut it off right there. It just stops, right? But if Jesus just rose from the dead and he he wasn't exalted into heaven, then we have a Jesus who's risen. He's at large, but he's just kind of roaming around the earth somewhere, maybe hiding in a bunker. And we're just trying to find the risen Jesus. But Jesus, 40 days after he rose, was exalted by God into heaven to be our eternal high priest, to be Lord of the nations, to whom will come the obedience of all peoples. Peter tells this, he says, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. Christ exalted to heaven, reigning over the nations, receiving from the Father the gift of the Spirit and dispensing and pouring out the free gift of the Holy Spirit upon his people and upon all who will repent and believe, giving them eternal life. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand 
until I make your enemies your footstool. I love this because when Stephen, in the book of Acts, one of my favorite stories, Stephen is testifying to the risen Jesus, they start to stone him for preaching Jesus. And as he's being stoned, he cries out to the people killing him. And he says, I see heaven open. I see the glory of God. And I see Jesus standing at the right hand of God. What an ironic, powerful moment where he's being killed for preaching and exalted Christ. And then the heavens blast open for Stephen and he sees that very exalted Christ. What if we lived with such a mind that we lived seeing in the eyes of faith, the exalted Christ looking down on us, guiding us, ruling over us, caring for us, sanctifying us. Philippians 2 is so powerful. It just says something stunning, just takes your breath away. When I first became a Christian and I read Philippians 2, it's just this sweeping, cosmological, massive statement. It says, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And I've been at sporting events many times where I can't help but look around at 60,000, 80,000, 100,000 people and think every breathing human in this stadium is going to bow the knee to Jesus Christ when he comes and confess with their mouth literally that he is Lord. Whether they are in hell or whether they are in heaven or whether they are on earth or whether it's a demon or an angel, every living being to ever exist will say the very same thing. I just thought of, you know, those movies, the, the Avenger movies. I'm kind of getting over those. They're kind of getting old, predictable. But there is this scene where Loki, one of the bad dudes, he wants to rule over this crowd of people. And he's slamming his scepter and he's saying, kneel, kneel, you know. And he's like, you were made to be ruled. And the whole crowd just bends before him. It's a really powerful scene that is nothing like how many people will bend before Jesus Christ, not, over an, not because he's an oppressive king, but because he is a righteous, good, and worthy king. This is how exalted he is. And then Peter says here in this verse on the screen, he sort of summarizes what he's saying, and he says that all the house of Israel therefore know for certain, there it is, that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. I want to leave this morning certain in every moment that Jesus Christ is Lord, that Jesus Christ lived for me, that Jesus Christ died for me, that Jesus Christ rose for me, that Jesus Christ is exalted interceding for me, that Jesus Christ will rule all peoples and that he's active in our lives and active in my life. And that his promises for me are true, that I can take them to the bank. And that I would leave knowing for certain that God made him Lord and Christ. So I said, my job's to preach it. Your job's to rejoice over it. Because if you know this Christ, you have encountered him as Paul did on the road to Damascus. You, you, you have, in a sense, really heard from Christ You've really been changed by Christ and your, your life has been flipped upside down. You're a new creature, the Bible says. What a powerful sermon. Well, how do the people react? These very people that crucified Christ. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. Convicted, convinced it was true by the power of God. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? We know it's true now. We're convicted of our sin and our murder. What do we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. And he gives two promises for the forgiveness of sins. And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And I really like 39 for the promise is for you and for your children. I really like that. This is for all people who can consciously understand at the most basic level what Jesus did and who he is. 
It's for you and your children and all who are far off from God. Everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. That if this morning you're sitting here and you're hearing what's been preached for 2,000 years, that old, old gospel, and for the first time, you're not just hearing it one ear in, in one and out the other, you're actually cut to the heart. That's our prayer, that you're cut to the heart. And you're saying, what do I do? What do I do? Well, the answer is that Jesus has already done the work for you and Jesus wants you to turn back to him in repentance and he wants you to believe on him and trust in him and ask him for his mercy. Lord Jesus, save me, a wretched sinner. Save me, have mercy upon me, forgive me. Make me a new person. Give me eternal life. I want all that you have to offer. I want all that you are. Repent and be baptized. And if you're cut to the heart and you realize this is real, just like these people did, we want to baptize you. I want you to talk to me or someone with a lanyard. We would love to talk about faith in Christ with you. We would love to schedule a baptism for you. We would love to enable you and help you actually do what these men and women did, which is repent and be baptized. And the greatest news is, is if you do that, you can walk out this morning even forgiven of your sin and know that God, the Holy Spirit, lives inside of you, meaning you have a union with Christ. You have new life in God. You have the Holy Spirit. And this is for all people, men, women, and children. Guys, the gospel is not about what we do. It's about what he has done which is why Easter is a day of rejoicing. That I'm preaching and I'm hoping you're rejoicing. And if you have trusted in Christ, you have repented and you have been baptized, very briefly, right here at the end before we pray, I wanna remind you, the believer, the saved person, exactly what this means for your present and your future. And I hope these truths are bedrocks for your soul. If this is you, if you have repented and been baptized, you need to remember today that Jesus paid your entire sin debt. There is no more debt. You never wake up any single moment of your day or any day with any debt before God. Jesus rose from the dead. He is exalted, which means he's interceding for you at every moment in heaven with his own blood. When you sin and fail, he's interceding for you. When you're weak or when you feel strong, he's interceding for you. This Jesus has completely forgiven you because he has authority as Lord in Christ to forgive sin. This same Jesus has given you the spirit of God that you have the Holy Spirit are united with Christ in this new living eternal relationship. That Jesus from heaven is making you holy and he will complete that process no matter how long it takes. This same Jesus won't stay in heaven. This same Jesus is coming back from heaven. He said, behold, I am coming quickly. This Jesus, when he comes, will raise you from your grave, physically, bodily, and mortally. We often think about dying and going to heaven. What I think about is dying and going to heaven and longing for the day that Jesus comes from heaven to raise me from the grave. And when he comes, he will raise you and the greatest gift of all, you'll be with him forever. This is the good news of Easter. Let's go thank the Lord in prayer. We love you, Lord. Thank you for being the king that we always needed, the savior that we always needed. We're so grateful for the old, old gospel that's as old as the church, that's as old as the apostolic gospel that they proclaimed, that we can go and live with an invincible faith and an invincible Christ. I pray that we would live differently because of who he is, live differently because of what he's done. I pray we'd live without fear, without fear of sickness, without fear of death, without fear of demonic powers and authorities, without fear of what could happen to us in this life, in this age, because Jesus, though we have suffering of many kinds, you have overcome the world. Though we have trouble of many kinds, you have overcome the world. You have overcome the devil. You have overcome sin. You've overcome the grave. You've swallowed it up. We're so grateful. We're so humbled before you. We love you, Lord, because you first loved us. We thank you. In the great name of Christ, we pray. Amen.